the draft stopped after World War II. But in 1950, when North Korea was invaded, or South Korea was invaded by North Korea in June of 1950. And then uh, at that time, uh, President Harry Truman declared a police action. Uh, the reason for him declaring a police action, because in, in order for him to declare all-out war, he would have to have the approval of Congress. And he couldn't wait for the approval of Congress because the invasion of uh, North Korea to South Korea took, happened so quickly that they had to do something as fast uh, to retaliate against the uh, North Koreans. But uh, in uh, 1950, I believe the draft was reinstated mm -hmm. right about that particular time. And uh, when you were drafted, you were drafted normally for 36 months. Myself, I waited for a little bit, and to encourage people to join the military, the uh, Army, or the, the draft put out a program, I guess it was the Army, that if you uh, enlisted for 21 months, you could enlist for 20 months, one months, and, and have your tour of duty end at that particular time instead of staying for 36 months. So myself, I thought that was a pretty good deal. So I enlisted for 21 months. Unfortunately, about three months after I was in the military, Uncle Sam decided to extend everybody that was 21 months to 36 months. So took that deal right off so, the table. Uh, yeah. It really it, it, it enticed a lot of people to join the military, but once we got there, here we are for 36 months again. <laughs> But I did enlist in the military, in the Army. Uh, at that time, we did have a choice. You could enlist in the Navy, Air Force, Army, Marines. Uh, I picked the Army. Why? I really have no explanation. Uh, I just, uh, I probably just wanted to uh, get my obligations of the military out of the way, so I joined the Army. Uh, after I joined the military, uh, I'm originally from Connecticut, and uh, we were sent up to uh, Fort Devens up in Massachusetts, which I believe is closed yeah, today. It's closed now. Uh, there was an induction center, and there we went up there, and we received all the necessary military clothing and other equipment that we needed, and they gave us all the shots that we required. And then I was sent down to Fort Belvoir, Virginia for basic training. <clears throat> After basic training, they sent me to a few schools. And uh, after uh, I uh, finished schools, I was given a 30-day leave. And then I went back home into, I lived in Bristol, Connecticut at the time. And so I went back home. After I was home for about a week, I received another telegram from my, from my good uncle, and he had plane tickets for me from Logan Airport to report to Fort Lawton, Seattle, Washington. So I knew exactly where I was going. So I uh, boarded the trip, boarded the plane in, uh, in Boston, and flew out to uh, Seattle, Washington. Uh, there, uh, Seattle, Washington is a seaport, so we uh, were all expected to uh, board ships to uh, go to the uh, to go to Korea, uh, but at that time they needed military personnel, and they couldn't wait for us to board ships. So they flew us over to uh, Japan. When I reached Japan, then they put us aboard trains and sent us across the country to the seaport of Sasebo. And from Sasebo, they put us on landing barges, and we landed in Incheon, Korea. From Incheon, I was transported by two and a half ton trucks. They transported the uh, military people that had arrived in Korea up to their destination. I was assigned to the 7th Infantry Division, 13th Engineer Combat Battalion. We were located in an area 
up a little bit north of the 38th parallel. The engineering company uh, is pretty much like the CBs that you probably are more familiar with from World War II. We uh, constructed roads, we uh, laid minefields, cleared minefields. We did just about anything that was necessary. We were in support of the 32nd Infantry Regiment, which was part of the 7th Infantry. And at times when they need infantry soldiers, they converted us and we also acted as infantry up on the uh, uh, 38th parallel. We were in an area called the Kumwa Valley. It was made up of a group of, uh, I call them hills more than mountains. They call them mountains over there. Uh, they weren't mountains as, as I expected to see. They were more, more like hills. And uh, in that area, they called it the Iron Triangle because of the configuration of the hills that were up in that area there. I was uh, with my company, Company B, in that area for approximately 14 months. And after our, my tour of duty in the 14 months, we were also on a point system in order to be rotated back to the States. If you were up on the front line, you received four points a month and three points further back and so forth. Uh, and you had to have 40 points to be able to rotate back to the States, plus a replacement. So a lot of us went out far beyond the 40 points before we were able to get a replacement so we could be uh, returned back to the States. So after my duty in Korea. I uh, returned uh, back to the States and uh, when I was sent back to the States we left Incheon Harbor by boat and we were at sea for 42 days. Oh my God. Everybody asked how come 42 days? Well we went across the Pacific Ocean down through the Panama Canal up the east coast of the Atlantic Ocean and landed in New York Harbor. Everybody that lived east of the Mississippi was sent on that particular transport to go home. So by the time I landed in New York Harbor, my time in the service had already expired. But uh, uh, the military uh, at that particular time uh, really didn't uh, care about uh, that. So. They kept us uh, at Fort Kilmore, New Jersey, and then uh, I eventually uh, went back home and received my uh, discharge uh, about, well, we had to go into either active reserve or inactive reserve after your military. I went into inactive reserve and I was uh, obliged to stay there for seven years and after seven years we received our official uh, uh, honorable discharge. So that's your question, Commander. Yes. Uh, Commander is 90 years old. He looks pretty good for 90 years old. Would you, would you serve, would you enlist again if you were a young individual? If uh, under the same circumstances, absolutely. Imagine that. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, absolutely. Just One thing I want to mention. I believe of all the wars that have taken place, uh, many of our members would say, uh, say, I think, say the same thing. If you had to be in a war, it would be the Korean War. Why? Because the Korean people just can't say enough and can't support the Korean veterans so, like South Korea. any other people in, South the, Korea. in the world. Uh, our friends in South Korea. Right. Uh, Commander talked about the 38th parallel. The 38th parallel, it separates North Korea from South Korea. And if you've ever been to Washington, D.C. on the 8th grade class trip, and you see the Korean uh, memorial, there's 19 statues. Those 19 statues reflect into the wall, 19 and 19 is 38, 
because that's the dividing line and it still is today yes it still is today. It, it's the same way as when these guys left that country it's still the same way today south korea is our friends north korea not so much our friends right now when you as michael mentioned the 38th parallel a lot of people picture it as just a, a narrow strip of land across the country. In Korea, the 38th parallel stretches 60 miles from one coast to the other coast. And it's two miles wide. So even if you go over there today, you can still, you will see the 38th parallel more manned by the North Koreans than the South Koreans. It's a, it's a DMZ that is not allowed to, even to this day, not allowed to pass through the DMZ without special permission. Right. Have any, any questions for, for the commander? Yes. When you landed, did you land in North or South Korea? When you landed, commander, did you land in North Korea or South Korea? <coughs> we landed in South Korea. Incheon, Korea, Incheon is a, it's a harbor on the west coast of Korea. It's approximately about 20 miles, 20, 25 miles south of the 38th parallel. How many guys, about how many guys in your, in your unit? An engineering company that I was attached to, it was a very small company. At full capacity, we're probably at 200 men. But when I was over there, we were approximately between 140 and 150 personnel. Not, not a lot. Made up of four, the, the company itself is made up of four platoons. And, uh, and a large, uh, and uh, uh, I take that back, it's, uh, well, four, four platoons that are combat, engineer personnel. The other personnel made up, a large part of our company is made up of maintenance personnel because being an engineering engineering company, we had uh, bulldozers and road scrapers and other pieces of equipment that had to be maintained. And you have to remember all of the equipment that we had was leftover equipment from World War II. So there was a lot of maintenance. Thank you. To maintain this quick. <clears throat> yep. So it sounds like your journey was very, very long. And at any point, did you ever second guess your decision into going into the military? No, I, ne I, I never had a second guess. And uh, in my situation, I think it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I think if you talk to a lot of veterans, they all feel the same way. It's an entirely different type of life that you live. And it's a life that's hard to explain to people who have not experienced that. Uh, I think it's a, it's a type of life that takes a young teenager and makes him grow up very fast. You become very self-reliant. And the training that you get, even when we were in, is, is uh, just remarkable. Uh, that our, my basic training lasted for 16 weeks. And at the end of 16 weeks, we could do just about anything. When I got to Korea, we had to put a bridge across a small river so trucks could go across. We could construct that bridge in less than a day. And then we and we also removed those bridges probably in quicker time. Uh, it's it's hard for me to uh, give you a definite answer, but uh, would I do it again? Absolutely. And I'm not a uh, military type of person. I have members of my t family who have spent 24 and 25 years in the military. Uh, I don't think I would want to do that, 
but I definitely would do what I have done in the past. Very proud. To, uh, most veterans that, that I've met uh, were very proud to serve. Come here to sit, relax a minute. We're going to have. Uh, well, one thing I would want to mention uh, yeah. Dick, Mindy, and I were invited to a dinner uh, this past week up in uh, Massachusetts mm -hmm. by a group of mm -hmm. Korean people. And they do this to the veterans quite frequently. In fact, our chapter will be invited on the 14th of next month to go up to Framingham for what they call an appreciation dinner. They, have, they put that on every single fall. And every veteran that goes up there is greeted, hugged, bowed to from all these Korean people. And when you leave, you always leave with a gift. They always want to give the Korean veteran something to remember them by. It just they're just a remarkable. I, I think this was, was people. this one of the gifts one year? This is one of the gifts one year. A medallion that was given to us from the Consulate General in Boston from the people of South Korea. They're just a, 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 a very remarkable group of people. They're a very active organization here in Rhode Island called the Korean American Association of Rhode Island. They have a building down in Cranston where right now they're converting it over to a library so you can see all the various Korean artifacts down there. That will be open, I believe, right after the first of the year. That's, uh, I, the commander's telling you that uh, the South Korean people were so appreciative. They, they saved their lives, and they saved that country, uh, and they never forgot. How many years has it been, Commander? Well, last July 27th, downtown province, there's a statue of a Korean veteran. We were down there celebrating the 66th anniversary of the peace signing or not the peace signing, the ceasefire signing of Korea. So uh, the three of us were in there a few years before. I so. seen you on TV that Capital TV covered it. Capital TV is a, a private cable company that covers all the events. They actually cover reach across America. And I, I did put the channel on and I saw you guys in downtown Providence. I said, there they are, the Korean War veterans. Uh, I noticed that uh, we talk about public speaking and, and presenting in class, and you'll always see me at Reach Across America. I always have a piece of paper in my hand. The commander talked from knowledge that's upstairs in his head, but Al Delano came this morning. He goes, you know, I, I, got, I got some note cards, and, I, and that's beautiful. That's a great teaching experience, uh, experience for the kids to understand that. Yes, you can have a piece of paper in your hand to... Uh, to remind you or refresh your memory. That's that's a good quality for, for presenting. I'm, I'm, while you're talking about Al Gallardo, between the three of us here, <laughs> Al Gallardo is a recipient of the Purple Heart. Tell him that I, I didn't receive the Purple Heart thing. What's the requirements for that? I, I can mention it. Yeah, sure. I'll let Al All right. Explain that. Al, you were also in the United States Army. Yes, sir, I was. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I was drafted. You were drafted. How old were you? I was, well, I was drafted in April and I turned 21 in May, the following month. Okay. So, it's my turn, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I hope you don't mind me using cards. Not at all, not at all, Al. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. And thank you for the invitation to share some of my experience, not all, but some of my experience at Islander service of our country. I was inducted into the Army on April 28, 1952, along with several other men from Rhode Island. Our first stop was at Fort, De Fort Devens, Massachusetts, where we would receive Army clothing, equipment, and least of all, a GI haircut, which I don't see anyone here no. <laughs> with that type of a haircut. 
Anyways, after a few days at, at Fort Devens, our next stop was at Fort Dix, New Jersey, for 16 weeks of basic training. As Dick alluded to, it would take 16 weeks. From <coughs> then in September of 1952, we boarded an Army troop train at Fort Devens, Massachusetts, and we were headed to Oakland, California. The, trip, the train took a southern route to California. The, train, the trip was awful. We ate out of paper plates. It was very, very hot. How many days out? It took us about a little over a week. Yeah. And as we made these stops, we'd have to get out a while just, just to get a bit of air. But then we finally got to Oakland, California. When we arrived at Oakland, we immediately boarded a ship that took us to Tokyo, Japan. We stayed in, jo in Tokyo for about 36 hours to check our equipment and maybe a couple hours to do a little sightseeing. Tokyo was a beautiful city at that time. And this was shortly after the World War II ended. You would think that Tokyo was like New York City. Fortunately, unfortunately, we couldn't stay there too long. Then we boarded another ship, and this took us to Busan, Korea. And upon landing in Busan, I was assigned to the 2nd Infantry Division, 9th Infantry Regiment, 1st Battalion, Company G. We boarded trucks, and we had a straight to the front line which at the time was called the main line of resistance. We used the shortcut as the MLR. When I arrived, the war was sort of as, was at a stalemate. There wasn't much fighting going on except for going out on patrols, hoping to capture Chinese or so uh, North Korean prisoner, which unfortunately we never, I, we never did anyways. So we would, like I say, except for artillery fire, the area was relatively quiet. While on the MRI, our shelter was what we called Abe Lincoln bunkers. They were made up of log, wooden logs piled high with sandbags. It was here that I received sharp wounds from enemy artillery fire. I was immediately transported for medical care, and after one day of taking care, I was sent back to my unit because my wounds were not very serious. From Port from We, oh, oh I, I forgot to say that uh, when, uh, while we were on uh, 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 with the Abe Lincoln bunkers, we were on a hill that was called Pork Chop. Uh, Pork Chop Hill, <coughs> prior to my arrival, was a scene of very, very heavy fighting. I was, I mean, I was transferred for, for, uh, to care by wounds. And then the company was relieved from Pork Chop Hill, and we were sent to on another hill. And this hill was called Old Baldy. Again, many prior to my arrival, many, many battles were fought there. The hill was so barren that it got the name Old Baldy. After being on the main line of resistance for about three months, my company received word that the company's supply clerk was rotating home and they needed a replacement, but you had to know how to type. So fortunately, I had taken typing in high school and I was selected for the job. The company, 
the company that supplied that was located about three miles back from the main line of resistance, which was a relatively safe area. There were two large tents that I was responsible for. One was for the personal belongings of all of our service men, all of our men in our company, which contained, they were contained in 48 duffel bags. I was assigned with two Korean civilian laborers to help me do my work. One tent was for the, for the, for the uh, personal belongings. The other tent was for my office and for st sleeping quarters. We were kept very busy as the company moved very often. Each time we moved, we had to break down the two tents, load them on trucks, go to our next destination, unpack, stop, put up the tents again, and put all, us, all the equipment and supplies back in order. Finally, on July 25th, I thought it was, to, right, 25th. on the 25th in 1953, an armistice was signed by members of the United Nations and the U.S., and all the hostilities finally ended. In September of 1953, I rotated home. The ship landed at Fort Lewis, Washington, and after being served a steak dinner at the mess hall, we boarded a civilian train back, heading back east. This trip was really, really amazing. We were issued Class A uniforms. We had to be dressed in Class A uniforms. We were served dinner in the dining, dining uh, train. The food was excellent. And we made a couple of stops that were very interesting to me. We stopped at the Hoover Dam and one more stop at Mount Rushmore, where the heads of two, uh, where the heads of four presidents are located. We arrived at Fort Devens, Massachusetts, on a Sunday. We were given a 30-day furlough. We sent, went home, spent the 30 days with our family and loved ones, and then back to Fort Devens. I was honorably discharged in January of 1954 and was placed on inactive duty for the next six years. I would like to end by reminding you that the Korean War was known as the Forgotten War, but we must never, ever forget that 38,000 service men and women made the ultimate sacrifice for the freedom that we all enjoy today. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Hit with shrapnel, a bomb goes off. Right. You know, a bomb goes off and bomb, shrapnel goes everywhere. Where were you hit? We were hit, I was hit in my right leg, left shoulder, and right wrist. So it wasn't really serious, you know, where. Well, you got hit. I got hit. I shed blood, but <laughs> let me put it that way. And that, and based on that, is where I received, I received the purple heart. Right. And tell them. What's this pin for? Uh, one of them is for the United Nations. The UN. Yeah. The United Nations. Nice. Yeah. And the middle one is the Korean service. Korean service. Korean service. And this is the Purple Heart, which I have at home. Now, were you a Rhode Islander? Yes. Sir. Where did you grow up? Providence. In Providence. Mm -hmm. so you're from Rhode Island your whole life? Yes. Mm -hmm. But I've been in the Smithfield residence for the last 22 years. I'm a Smithfield resident on my soil. Three years I lived in Greenfield. I love it. Yeah. One thing I want to mention, Al mentioned those casualties during the Korean War. Yeah. Approximately 38,000 men and women lost their lives. Right. It's called the bloodiest war. Why? Because those lives were lost in a period of three years. 
In Vietnam, they lost 40, lot, 40 a little over 44,000 lives over a period of 10 years. Right. Exactly. Uh, South Koreans, uh, they estimate that they had a million casualties. Yeah. And much more. Dick, you're also in the United States Army. I was in the Army. Did you get drafted? I was drafted. How old were you when you were drafted? I was 20. 20? Yeah. Was that about the average age? Yes. For back in, for, yes. for Korea or more? I know Vietnam was a little bit younger, yeah. but uh, 20 years old. Yeah, were you originally from Rhode Island? Yeah, I lived in Rhode Island all my life. I've done quite a bit of traveling, but uh, Rhode Island is my hometown. And you got drafted, and where did you go to uh, boot camp? I went to uh, Indian Town Gap. Where's that? That is in Pennsylvania. Okay. And uh, I, uh, I was drafted. Uh, went to a place called Fields Point, and Fields Point is where all the draftees would go. That's down in Allen's Avenue in the city. And what happened there was uh, there was a bunch of us. Uh, and they picked so many for the Army, Navy, Marine Corps. I was picked for the Army. That's how I ended up in the Army. Went to Devon's, the recent one, to these folks here. And then to Indian Town Gap for 16 weeks of basic training. All working for you, I was indoctrinated on that. Uh, up to that point, I didn't even know what a gun was. But uh, I certainly found out uh, after basic training, they put us on a, a, a train that took you know, five or six days across the country. It was just on one car, and we made stops along the way. And by the time we got to uh, the West Coast, we must have had at least 20 cars, all filled with uh, soldiers, because each stop they would load up. That's what happened when I got to the West Coast. Got on a boat, got on a ship, uh, went over to uh, Yokohama, which is in uh, Japan. And from there, every morning we'd hit Reveille, and they'd pick out names who went directly to Korea. I was there maybe 10 days, and every day I'd fall out for a Reveille, and couldn't understand why aren't they calling my name. And this one day, they did call my name. Now, I was infantry up to that point, and they decided to send me to school. So I went to school, and they changed my MOS. The MOS is either infantry, engineers, whatever that, that takes. That 1583 is what I ended up with as an MOS. And uh, I uh, worked with the Japanese in various uh, areas. And uh, for six weeks, I uh, ended up uh, learning a new phase of, of the army. And then after that, there were seven of us that graduated. They put us on a civilian train, and we went from Yokohama all the way to Sasebo. Sasebo was where you left to go to Korea. We stopped at Hiroshima, Nagasaki. These are areas that were where the atomic bombs were. And the thing of it is that this is like 52, 53 area, and those areas were still devastating. Unbelievable. Yeah. Which was 10 years. Yeah. Uh, at least. Before well, it was, yeah, 44, 45, I guess. It's, but it was amazing how that area, and today I understand it's a big metropolis. So we went to Pusan. They put us on a uh, rickety old train, and they brought us up north. And eventually I ended up in a place called Young Dung Po. Everyone's heard of Young Dung Po, right? <laughs> well, Young Dung Po is, uh, today is a big metropolis also. It's outside of Seoul and in China, where we came to this area. And uh, 
I became uh, a sergeant. Uh, every three months, they kept on giving me stripes. I don't know why, but they did. And I was very appreciative to get those stripes. Get a pay increase. Yeah, it was a pay increase. Yeah, most of all that money went to my mother. You know, so I didn't have too much money to spend over there. What was your pay at, back then? Oh, she was not sure I didn't remember. What was it? It was less than a hundred bucks. A yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't much. I was SFC and I earned a hundred and sixteen dollars a month. A month. Yeah, we did become rich people. You know? yeah. Big money. Yeah. 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 Didn't know how to spend it. You know? yeah, so really. I spent it to my, my poor mother who was uh, bringing up uh, three other <laughs> children. <laughs> and uh, that yeah, was a good income. Yeah, right yeah. I got, yeah, we got. So, they made me uh, in charge of this group. We had maybe 50 or 60 people that were on In field maintenance, uh, we took care of uh, parts uh, that were necessary for trucks and all the various equipment they had over there. It was, uh, I, I was very lucky, really, when you think about it. How close were you to the front line? Uh, probably about 20 miles. Every night we'd have uh, a plane that would come over. It was Good Night Charlie. We had a nickname for him. And what he would do, he'd fly over there. And of course, we were close to an air base. And he had all the artillery going up, trying to knock this plane down. Every night, that plane would come over and it would drop. Like uh, small uh, like grenades and things of that nature, too. And of course, then you'd have to get out of your tent and do a, do a little sandbag perimeter. But that was kind of interesting how that came about. Uh, I uh, ended up, uh, after a number of months, <coughs> going to Japan. They call it R&R, &R, Rest and Rehabilitation. After you've been there for so many uh, months. So they sent me to uh, I could have gone to Hong Kong or Japan. I decided to go to uh, Japan. And I went to Tokyo for a little while, and then to a town north called uh, whatever it was, what the name was. Yeah, Jeff. I've got so many things in there. Uh, Kaiyuzan. Now, Kaiyuzan used to be a uh, place where all rich people would go. And uh, they ended up being uh, a place where if you went on an hour and hour, you could stay there. And how long was hour and hour there? A week. A week. Yeah. Five days. Five days. We went over there and they, they treated you pretty good. You know? And then of course an hour and hour, now you're back to Korea. But it was, it was a, a good break, really, as far as that part was concerned. Uh, I've got a couple of things here. One of the things that uh, dog tags. Everyone ever heard of dog tags? Yeah. Okay, this is my original dog tag. US 5115592. Oh, you <laughs> so, never so, forget so, that. So memorize. And that gives your name and that number that I just. Uh, Can I let them see it? Oh, yeah, yeah, pass it around. That's the original dog type. And it tells you your faith and yeah. your blood type. And if you are captured at some time or other, uh, that's the only thing that you ever mention. Yeah. Name, rank, and serial number. Yeah. So that's been around for a little while. Uh, I was, before I left the house this morning, I didn't find that, but I put some stuff in there. That's okay, you come in. Yeah, no problem. Hmm. It's such a good job, I don't know where to put Anyway, the, uh, Different areas I, I just wrote down there. Yokohama, Tokyo, Nagasaki, Hiroshima, Sasebo, Kaiyuzama, 
Seoul, Busan, Incheon, Yongnanpo. These are all areas that uh, I visited while well, we're stationed at. So I really did see a good part of the countries over there. Like Dick said, the Korean people could not be any nicer to us. Have you ever been back to Korea since? No, I thought about it. Uh, the Korean government does offer a tour back there. Right. And we could go back and they would pick up almost all expenses and uh, have a chance to visit these various areas. But I've never had to take advantage of that. How about the Korean Memorial in Washington, D.C.? Have you been? I've been there, yes. Right. Uh, we had, uh, what was it? We went through a day. The Honor Flight? The Honor Flight. Oh, you were on that Honor Flight yeah, too? Yeah. yeah, the Honor Flight was uh, nice. You visit all the uh, uh, memorials that they had. The Korean Memorial. Spend a day in Washington and then they fly you. Yeah, you leave like, like uh, you're home about 4 o'clock in the morning right. and you get back around 11 o'clock at night. But everything, it's really a great place. You know. It's where we met. Our former senator, Bob Doe. Oh, Bob Doe's, yeah, that's uh, right. He was on the news. He would sit in, 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 a, in a chair. Yeah, in a wheelchair. He would greet, he would greet all the veterans yeah. and would take, uh, take photos with them. I have, I have a photo at home with them. Nick, tell here, here are the pictures. Yeah. You want to see me? <laughs> you know, you're just a kid. Yeah. Was this in Korea? That was in Korea, yeah. Everybody had some pictures. And one of the things after the troops, I was a gymnast. Not the greatest gymnast, but I was a gymnast. And somehow or other, my CO found out about my past. And uh, so after the troops, so things kind of quieted now. And he took me to one side one day and he says, Can you do anything with us? You know, we got a lot of this spare time now. And he says, uh, nice if you could organize something. So I organized uh, gymnastics. Uh, every day uh, we go out there for about an hour or so and train. And I, I built some parallel bars. Lord and a whole lot of them. This is in Korea. That's in Korea. Huh? <coughs> that happens to be me. <laughs> Maybe a test of us. It's still in good shape. You said you stayed slender. Yeah, I, I, I used to teach gymnastics. Right. Now, just so that you know, I was in the war zone. Right. I was making my... took a picture in front of the trucks. And uh, one of the things that they had for transportation over there was uh, something like this. We, have, uh, and we used to run five miles every morning. The whole Pakistan would have his little team over there, you know, and he would collect all. Oil. He would collect all the garbage, and uh, it was all deposited in their gardens. And it was one of the things when we go over there. He said, "Don't eat any of the local <coughs> food." because of what into the gardens is garbage. But they had made it over like this. They had two colors. You'd be surprised what our garbage does to uh, yeah. the vegetables. Fertilization, that's right. And so, uh, anyways, that was a good part. I, actually, it was, I don't have any regrets whatsoever. I got out of the service. And I started taking uh, night courses, and I took advantage of the GI Bill, and I got a degree from Brian College, courtesy of you and your folks. The, the GI Bill was a government uh, plan to pay for the veterans to go to school. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, a lot of veterans took a, took advantage of the training they had in the military, uh, helped them get jobs uh, back here. That worked out very nicely for me. And what was not paid by the government, uh, my employee, I used to work for a bank, by the way, at one time. I, I was there for a number of years. And prior to that, I uh, 
and in the jewelry business. I've had a very interesting life, really. I have four, four daughters. <coughs> it's a big family, and we keep them. Big brother lives right next to me. I have a question, go ahead, Dan. How would you say that the war has impacted you as like a person? I think it's made a, uh, it, it's made, made me grow up for one thing. I, mean, I remember I was very, very shy when I was in high school and so forth. And when I went in the service, <coughs> uh, it woke me up to the fact that uh, uh, I'm a man now. <laughs> but yeah, it was, I would, I, I think back, uh, back in the, the early days of my service, uh, being involved with all these things, that made me grow up, there's no question about it. And I got to Korea, well, the very first day I got to Korea, uh, they put me on guard duty, and we had, I hate to say this, but the orders were shoot to kill them. If that won't wake you up, that's something. At 20 years old, 21 years old, yeah. Um, Dick, I'd like to, I'm, I'm going to ask all, all three of you, um, the Korean War uh, ended probably uh, b before I was born and probably before this, their parents were born, but as far as uh, reach across America and recognizing the veterans, what, what does that mean to a veteran that we have students 66 years later talking about your service? How important is that? That's very important. That's extremely important. Uh, because of the fact that it brings to light what actually had exactly. taken place. You know? and, uh, what you put on it, uh, Mike, is, is, is remarkable. You know, Mike is the one that started that reach around. I don't know if you kids know that. Uh, but, uh, he's done a remarkable job himself. Yeah, we've, uh, school's done well. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure they they understand now the, the value of the, of the merits. Yeah, I did, you know, as far as uh, becoming a veteran, if you have the opportunity, join. Mm -hmm. I think it, it should work out nicely for them. And I wish you all good luck. Thanks, sir. Thanks. Commander, you're going to say something. I, I just wanted to mention Reese Across America. Uh, I do have, a, I have three daughters. Uh, one daughter is uh, teaching school down in Arlington, Virginia. And uh, she has with her, she, in fact, she just brought it to her class again at the beginning of the year. Uh, she uh, teaches fifth grade and she brings the book that I gave her so she could take the class signed by Michael Kalenda. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And Reese Across America. So she is talking about Reese Across America down in her school in Arlington, Virginia. We we started that uh, I'm not sure they, they understand that other schools, even in Rhode Island, I've gone to Pawtucket, I've gone to Warwick, I've gone to North Smithfield to take the veterans experience to other schools. Uh, but I've dealt with so many schools, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and I call us and say, hey, there's a, because when they call Reach Cross America, they say, listen, there's a school in Potagansa. You gotta talk to this guy and he'll tell you uh, how we how we started. We started very, very small uh, with our ceremony and uh, it's grown. It, it's, it's, it's grown a lot. We're very proud to be a part of it, Michael. Yeah. We thank you for including us. And these guys come every year, yes, Dan? What made you think of starting the Reach Across America? Because there was a there was a parent that went to a Reach Across America ceremony in Massachusetts, and she had kids at Pontiacanza, and she called me up and said, "Can you look into this Reach Across America?" And I said, "Sure." I was in the eighth grade teaching eighth grade history, and what I didn't know was it was going to take off the way it did. Uh, we have national recognition. I mean, the Reach Across America they place a a wreath on every single grave at Arlington National Cemetery. There's almost 300,000 uh, people buried there, mostly veterans, but there are some civilians buried there. Now we do that at the Rhino Veterans Cemetery. We have we take our wreaths and we send them to uh, the Rhino Veterans Cemetery, which 
for for Rhode Island, we have a tremendous, uh, well organized veteran cemetery. And they have so many volunteers down there yeah. that they can place all those wreaths yeah. in less than a day. Yeah. Very quick. It's a big. Uh, that's our ceremony is on a Tuesday. Uh, the actual wreaths across America wreath laying ceremony. They do it in Arlington and every cemetery, veteran cemetery across the country. There's over a million wreaths from Reach Cross America, and they do it all at the same time on that Saturday, you know? We're down at the Veterans Cemetery. Unless I go to Arlington, I'm in Rhode I, I have a chance to, to fly down to Arlington again this year. You know, I, I might be with Chief Del Pre, uh, so we'll fly down and, and fly back. But it, uh, to be in Arlington and, and see those those reeds, uh, but it, it's just, this is the start. I, I want you know, we always start with the Korean War veterans. They're the first guys that come in, and I, w I was thinking, uh, we've been around so long, we've had some of our members have passed away. Uh, and I said, look, these guys are Korean War guys, are 88, 80, late 80s, 90s. Even the Vietnam guys are getting into their, into their 70s now. Uh, but you, we will reach a point, unfortunately, in, in your lifetime as well as mine, we'll have, we have no more World War I veterans alive. And we're probably going to run out of World War II veterans. Uh, the, honor, the Honors Flight Program mm -hmm. takes all of the World War II veterans, veterans down first. Right. They have run out of right. World War II veterans. veterans. Now they take the grant. Well, now, all those come from, the reach come from Maine, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. All the reach come from Maine. For the whole country too? Yep. I've been up to the, to the farm. It's, it's enormous. He just bought another piece of it's miles and miles and acres and acres of, uh, of trees. And they, uh, they've got two factories. I actually was in the, in the factory. They start in October getting ready for December. Yeah, they produce them. They, they've even gone to, they went to Pearl Harbor. They've gone to New York. They went to the Statue of Liberty places to read, read at the Statue of Liberty. So they've, they've gone to, the, and last year, they went to Normandy. And they placed reach in Normandy, so it's uh, it's quite an experience. Uh, it's been good for the school. It's been real good for the school, and uh, I I think our students rank at the top when it, when it comes to, to having veterans uh, come in. Any uh, any other questions? Uh, you know about I always had I know the answer. But what was the temperature like in Korea? Oh, I just was going to mention that. Yeah. The temperature in Korea in the winter was very, very cold. And in the summer, very, very hot. And I was fortunate to be, to be in Korea at the time, at that particular time, when the war started, a lot of the Marines that were stationed in Tokyo had all World War II clothing and weapons. And when we pushed up, up to the northern part to the Yalu River, many, many of our Marines had frozen feet, frozen hands. It was, then the Chinese came into the war and pushed us all the way, all the way back to the, to the 38 power line. But the winters were brutal. The first, the first winter, they were, they were set a record in, in Korea. They had never had a cold winter like that and not since then. They were recording temperatures of 20 degrees below zero. And the GIs were out there with just yeah. just their you clothing. You see the TV show on, on TV, MASH? Yeah. yeah. That's based on... That's the hospital that that's, I... That's, yeah, the, I that's based on the Korean War. That show is based on the Korean War. You know, you talk about uniforms. Uh, after the truth, we had thousands of prisoners, Chinese and North Koreans. And I can remember being in Yongan Po, and the trains were taking these prisoners all the way down to Pusan, where they would be released if they wanted to. A number of them declined. But the clothing that they had, half of them never had any shoes. And it was very, the clothing was very, very thin. And this is the end of it. 
thing. How was the food in Korea? Depends on where you were located. Really? I ate my Thanksgiving dinner out of a paper plate on Old Baldy. No. I ate everything out of a tin can. <coughs> we had called salt rations. Yeah, sea rations. Right? Yeah, sea rations. We went from sea rations to salt, salt rations. rations. Yeah. Um, there were it was about the size of a large tomato soup can, and everything was in there, including a pack of cigarettes. Okay. I don't remember that. Yeah, you know, they encourage cigarettes for some reason. Just the opposite today. Now, I, I think a good way to, to wrap up today is these guys uh, came home in their Class A dress uniforms. The Vietnam guys were told, don't wear your uniforms home. These guys, as well as the World War II guys, were recognized as heroes. The Vietnam guys were not recognized as heroes. Uh, it was a, a, co a controversial <coughs> war. So it went from yeah, very, very, very unpopular. Just a slight correction. Yeah. The uniform that I left in Korea was the uniform that I entered my front door of my house in. Really? No kidding. But you were in uniform. When you came, were you on a, a military train home or a plane home or a commercial? Uh, coming home? Coming home. I came home by boat. I was the one who went through the Panama Canal okay. up through. And, and I we landed at, uh, in uh, New York Harbor at Camp Kilmore. Guys get seasick? Oh, yeah. Oh. I never got seasick, but I couldn't eat because we're watching everybody else getting sick. <laughs> yeah. James, you got a question? On a 42-day ride back, did you have enough rations to like, last the uh, trip? Did you, on a 42-day trip, how, did you have enough rations? Have enough food? Oh yes, yeah. no problem with food because majority of people didn't eat. Mm -hmm. They were so sick. Fortunately, I didn't get sick. But as I mentioned, uh, they there was plenty of food if you wanted to go down and eat it. But I didn't, couldn't eat it because, I, as I say, I was watching everybody else get sick, and I didn't want to get sick. Like I can't sit in the back seat of a car. I'm getting motion sickness. I have to sit in the front. If I go to anything longer than an hour, I have to take Dramamine because I get very emotional. And that's an awful feeling. I, I can't imagine that many days on a train or a boat uh, moving uh, like that. Um, and the last thing I wanted to, to ask is, how was the communication to back home to your families? It was all letters. There was no cell phones. There was no... Uh, one of, the nicest, I, oh, one of the nicest things while, while you're there is to receive a package from home with tuna fish and other goodies, you know? Sure. That was... Yeah, ma that. mail was very important. Because yeah. yeah, on the honor flight, uh, Dick's, I think it was your grandson, called yeah. me up and, and we actually send... They do a roll call. Maybe you can tell them, Dick, about the... The roll call and how they how the mail call came up after uh, after the uh, the day's trip down to Washington D.C. Everybody that was on the honors flight they brought them to a uh, local hotel down in uh, Washington D.C. where they served everybody uh, a, a real nice dinner. Uh, but during the dinner time, uh, they they had entertainment. Uh, I mentioned the Andrews sisters because I know nobody knows the Andrews sisters, but uh, there was three, three gals that went around and entertained the troops. And uh, they had uh, imitation of the, of the uh, Andrews sisters there. And also they had mail call. And at mail call, they would come around to the tables and give the uh, veteran who was on the honor flight a package of letters to open. And one of the letters that I opened was from Michael Kalenda. I received letters from all of my friends, my family. Uh, it was a complete shock to me, and I'm sure to anybody that went on that honors flight. Uh, we really didn't expect what we saw. 
It was just, uh, Dick mentioned, uh, you know, we started the wee hours in the morning here in Providence. And when we left, there was probably two or three hundred people reading, sending us off. Uh, the uh, police, the Providence police, uh, bagpipe, yep. bagpipers were there. And uh, when we got down to the Baltimore airport, another big crowd was there greeting us. When we left, it was the same thing. And when we got here to Rhode Island, uh, I, I landed myself. We landed here just about at midnight. And there had to be 100 people there greeting us coming in. It was just remarkable. And uh, people asked me, uh, Outside of my, my own wedding and my grandchildren and children, that's probably one of the most memorable, memorable days of my life. It's, uh, I tell the veterans uh, they have to go on that flight. It's just a, a real special thing. How do they select them? I know it's the firefighters. Do they just, how do they choose? I, I well, you have to fill out an application. Okay. And, uh, they, they uh, select the uh, recipients uh, as the applications come in. Uh, nobody is turned down, but you might not get on this flight, you might have to wait for the and next And there's no cost to that. The Fire Association, and I think it's the Police Chiefs Association. Fire, 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 fire Chiefs. Yeah. Fire Chiefs Association State sponsor. Uh, sponsor that. Uh, and it's approximately, to, to lift that plane off the ground to take it down to DC, you're looking at probably, uh, they said about 85 grand. Sure. Well, your plane tickets are plus all the other pieces. expenses, and it's free to the uh, to the veteran. They have to have a guardian with them. Myself, I had my grandson, and uh, I mentioned my grand. My grandson is 30 years old, so. He's not a youngster, but it was, a, it was just a wonderful, wonderful trip down. And I, I do want to go mention back a little bit because Reese across America is uh, a big thing for my family that lives down there, uh, have lived down there, because my son-in-law was a member of the Old Guard. And the Old Guard is the organization that takes care of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldiers. It's a two-year stint that they spent, and since then, uh, he he always go back, goes back there for their reunion, and he's always there for Reese across America. Yeah, that's a big day. That's a big day. It is. It's, it's quite an honor. Uh, it's a tremendous honor for the veterans oh, and, 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 for Pony, and for Pony High School. Yeah. Yeah, we well. When I went on my on a flight. We stopped at the Arlington Cemetery, right. and one of the veterans, his brother, was buried there. Okay. And they brought him out to the, to, the, to the memorial. There wasn't a dry eye on the bus. Oh, yeah, it was so, uh, and I still get a funny feeling when we were there. Originally, that was set up for World War II veterans. Really. But what's happening is that the World War II veterans are becoming less and less, yeah. and then they open it up to the Korean and now uh, Vietnam. And so it's quite a it's, it's quite an organization. George Farrell yeah. is the gentleman who yeah. runs. Yeah, he's come to reach. Yeah, yeah. He's, a, he's a retired province chief. Yes. And I think his son was on the fire department too. All right, we're going to let these guys go back to class. Uh, give me a few minutes to uh, get these gentlemen back downstairs. And I, I thought that we we took the stairs up. We could have took the elevator, but we all took them up, right? We, we climbed we're not that bad. We climbed that the class stairs. And uh, you'll get to see uh, not only these three members, but think about how many members in the honor guard. We have all the flags. And we'll probably, at the honor guard, we'll have probably around 15 to 18 people. Right. Absolutely. Well, and the last thing I wanted you to tell them about it is the Blue Jackets. 
what, how did the Blue Jackets come about? I, I forget that story. It's the color of the United Nations flag. The United Nations, that's it. Incidentally, United Nations, there are 15 United Nations groups over in Korea. Of course, the Americans, as we were, the most prominent. There's no question about that. Yeah. The, the thing I learned today, I never realized, is the 38th parallel. Was that why? I, I was, I was on the illusion it was more of just a, like a, a line. Like a path in the road. Exactly. Yeah. And it's too wild. That's well, so it's, it's the DMZ, which uh, you classify it as. And uh, it's an area where, when I was over there, it was a dangerous area to go into. And you were, sometimes you were better off north of it than you were on it. Because as, as Al mentioned, it, when we were over there, it was more or less of a stationary war. The, the organization that I became attached to, I, I joined them as they were returning from the Yalu River. And, and then uh, I, I was on uh, Old Baldy, but probably, I don't know, I, I didn't know Al or Dick or, or any of the members yeah. at the time. And uh, I, that hill, Old Baldy, uh, they decided to back off from the Old Baldy because they had changed hands, I believe seven times over a period of about eight weeks. So they decided that the loss was too great to continue. So they pulled back from Old Baldy. Did you, did you know anybody from Rhode Island that was with you in Korea? No. Or oh, you were from Connecticut? I didn't know anybody you know, from Connecticut that was over there. Oh, did, you, did you meet anybody from Rhode Island? That oh, oh, yeah, there was a lot of them that I've seen here, too. Yeah. And one, in fact, one of the members from Rhode Island, when we got to Korea, he was like one of the first casualties. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, he, again, more uh, artillery fire. He lost both his legs. And they shipped him to Walter Reed Hospital in Washington. And his father, who couldn't speak a word of English, took the train to go see his son in Walter Reed Hospital. Yeah, Mario, I'll, I'll never forget him. And there's another gentleman uh, that was in our group that was killed. And his name is embedded at the uh, Korean Memorial in, uh, at the cemetery. Veteran Cemetery. Right. And the the plaque, they put a plaque up for the Korean War veterans at the State House. Yes. But there's no veterans' names on that plaque. No. Okay. And I was there at the that, State that, Yeah, that's just a, a plaque just to memor, mem, remember the Korean War. Exactly. I was at that ceremony at the State House too. So we, we've been a lot of ceremonies. Yeah. It's, a, it's quite an um, any last questions before I take these gentlemen downstairs? Obviously, we want to thank them for coming in and uh, telling their stories. And uh, it starts off the Reach Across America because the next group we'll bring in is, is going to be the, uh, they're from the uh, VA hospital. And they're mostly all visually impaired. Some of them are blind. Uh, we bring those guys in. And that's a mix. That's World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Uh, we always start with the, with the, with the Korean guys. Uh, did I miss anything, Commander? Nothing other than do your job, yeah. get a good education, and many years of success to everybody here. Al, if you had to tell the students one thing, give them a piece of advice from a, from a crafty old veteran. I have to echo what our commander is. Stay in school as long as you can, get the best education, and make something of your life that's worthwhile, and make your family happy. Dick? All I can say is that it's been great for me to be here in front of you folks, and I do wish all of you a great life. How many uh, here think they might want to go into the military? We have probably answered kids. We have a strong number of kids and graduates that have gone into the military. Uh -huh. uh, at Pontiac, it's uh, 
we, we, they don't track that. I was trying to track it through the guidance department, but what happens when a kid graduates, and then a year after graduation, he joins the military, and we don't have any, any records of that, but Facebook has been a way to communicate, but we have a strong, strong party against it all night. Well, if we, can, if we can only stay out of wars, yeah. the service is a good career. One of the things, <coughs> when I worked for the jewelry company, it was Kurt Jones Company, and I was in charge of uh, going to uh, West Point, mm -hmm. Naval Academy, Air Force Academy, Coast Guard Academy, Merchant Marine Academy, selling rings to these people. And it's uh, magnificent. If you, if you haven't been to any of these areas, make it a point. Put it on your bucket list. And it's great to see how. I've been to West Point. I've been to Annapolis. I haven't been to the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard's great. Uh, it's close by, too. Yeah, yeah. And it's close by. And the Air Force Academy is magnificent, too. But they're all great. Once you see that, if that doesn't hike your value of veterans, then must be real. In closing, I would say, gentlemen, that you all proudly served your country. Uh, and that's a debt that really can't can be paid. They talk about a check that we owe the veterans. Uh, woke up today, you guys wore sweatshirts, you wore pants. We take a lot of the freedoms for granted, but a lot of veterans uh, as Al said, gave the ultimate sacrifice. They died serving our country, protecting our freedoms. And it's still happening today in Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Syria. Uh, we, we're still going on today. And we still have 33,000 troops in Korea. Exactly. Yeah. Strong military uh, presence.